other big kicker with, I would say all of these animals, um, except for maybe birds, but all of these animals in general, no, including birds, is don't feed them. Um, keep your garbage lids secure. Um, don't feed the deer corn or apples or anything like that. Um, if you're bringing them into your yard with food and then you don't want them to eat certain parts of your yard, they don't care what you like and what you want them to eat. They're just gonna eat whatever they can get their hands on. Um, so they don't, you can't put signs up to deer and say, don't eat this, eat this. They don't read very well. So um, yeah, so that's the general idea with all of these animals, but we can go into some of the more specifics for, for each of them as well. Now, most of them won't go climbing other fences. Right? No, it but depends, it depends on the animal. Fence, yeah. Yep, it depends on how big the fence is. Um, um, I'm not going to talk about coyotes today, but coyotes can actually get over pretty high fencing. Um, so if you have coyote problems, they generally suggest an eight-foot fence, much underneath that, and they can they can do pretty well. Um, squirrels can obviously get over most fences. <laughs> turkeys, <laughs> yep, turkeys. You'd be surprised. They they're not very good at flying, so. A lot of times you'll see them run, if, especially if your fence is taller, you'll see them run back and forth next to your fence. They won't actually fly over it because they're too, too <laughs> chunky to actually get over the fence. So, um, so to start with deer, um, deer, if you're having issues in your yard, I don't know what the specific issues are, if it's um, trees or if it's your garden specifically, um, but deer really like white pines, um, they really like cedar, your cedar trees, um, maples, sumac, they really like birch, um, any kind of dogwoods or viburnums. So if you have those, aspen they really like. So if you have those, they're going to they're gonna eat those. Um, you can prune your trees so that they can't get into the branches area. But keeping in mind that especially in the winter, you've got snowpack, you know, that's maybe a foot tall, and then they do go up on their hind legs and stand on the tree to try and get the, um, the last little tidbits there. So um, if you're going to prune your tree, um, keep that in mind. Otherwise, you can do fencing around your tree um, out away from the, the tree or closer into the tree, your call. But ultimately, the best option with those um, higher quality trees, especially if you're planting saplings, is to just get them in those full enclosed um, fencing units, at least until they get tall enough. Um, once they get to be a decent sized tree, I mean, once you get a full grown tree, um, the deer are going to nip at the tree and you're going to see the effects from the deer, but they're not necessarily going to kill the tree. Um, if it's big enough, if it's a smaller sapling, then um, the deer could potentially actually destroy that tree and kill it. Um, so it depends. Um, they don't like spruces, firs, red pine, and they actually don't like beech trees either. Um, and then there's a number of other trees out there that are kind of in the middle ground. It just depends on how much food is available to them. Everything that you read about um, deer though, is that just because they have high quality foods and low quality foods, doesn't mean they won't eat the low quality foods. Um, there's a lot of deer in Milwaukee County and there's a decent amount of food for them. But if you have a really tough winter, like this last winter, They'll just start eating whatever they can get their hands on. And, um, and sometimes that's the red pines and the spruces that you knew they weren't going to eat, but they are going to eat it because if it's the only food available, they'll eat it before they starve. So legally, um, by law enforcement, DNR standards, um, Milwaukee County, um, anywhere except Washington County in this part of the state, you are not allowed to feed deer. Um, or feed wildlife in general, but feeding wildlife generally equates to corn, putting out corn. I've seen people feed raccoons and they feed raccoons with cat food and then you're in the clear because you just say, well, I'm not feeding the wildlife, I'm feeding the cats that are, you know, in the, in the neighborhood. So, so people can get around that, but ultimately um, my suggestion to you is to not feed any of the wildlife. I, you can feed the birds, um, bird feeders or something like that. that yep, they will eat that. Yep, you can you can but put them up a little bit higher, and sometimes that helps. Yep, yep, exactly. Um, yeah, or you take the feeders down every night. 
that helps a lot too. Um, I know a lot of people during the winters, they'll take uh, corn cobs and, and feed them for, give them to the squirrels. But if you do that, you want it higher up because if you're just putting it on the ground, you've got, you've got deer issues. So, um, and if you, like, if you like birds, but you don't want squirrels, you might want to think about your, your feeding your birds habits just because, I mean, they're, they're going to be, the squirrels are going to be there if your bird feeder is there. You can try as hard as you can to squirrel proof your bird feeder. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes you get a really smart squirrel. So um, for me personally, I would rather have birds and a couple of squirrels than not have a bird feeder up. So it's worth it to me, but it just depends on what what your opinion is and what, what your situation is. Um, something else that I have heard but have never tried, so I'd be interested to see if anyone else has ever tried it. Um, deer and rabbits both apparently um, don't like pungent aromas. So if you plant um, if you plant herbs next to things that you don't want the rabbits to eat, so flower beds, um, if you um, put chives in there, or um, mint, um, or thyme, or something that's really um, aromatic, um, they don't like that smell, and so sometimes they, they're not going to go for that. I've also heard marigolds. Pretty sure that it has to be basically opposite a marigold and then a bean plant and then a marigold and then a bean plant. But that's, that's some other stuff that I've heard. I've, I've never tried the pungent aroma thing, but I think that might work. Yeah. It's like I said, it's supposed to work. I've never tried it. And in my experience, in my experience with dealing with nuisance animals, um, you do stuff and you're going to get, you're going to keep all the animals away except for that one. And that one is the problem. Um, so I think it would be really interesting. I think if you're going to go with anyone, I would actually suggest chives because I, I would assume that that would be the most undesirable of those plants. Mint chives and thyme, and pretty. I mean, anything. If you think mints, I mean, maybe cat catnip. Um, I read one. Yeah, just anything that smells. Um, lantana. I don't even know if that grows up here, um, but it's got that. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So if you put if you put something that smells next to something that you don't want them to eat, like the flowers or something. Oh. I was joking the other day, I'm pretty sure her, my mom, she stopped, um, she stopped growing green beans. She'll still grow a row or two, but it's basically just to feed the bunnies because it's useless. Yep, yep, they really, really like beans. I don't know what the problem is with that one. Yep, yeah, yeah, they're really bad. She can't do corn either for because of the deer a lot. Yep. So to, to switch and combine with deer and rabbits, I think those are two of the biggest problems. Um, so besides the pungent um, plants, that's supposed to work really well for deer. And I can only assume that if it works well for deer, I would think that it would also work pretty well for rabbits. Um, something else I've heard is combining, so the rabbit fence, the lower, you know, like foot and a half, two foot tall rabbit fence, and then um, doing solar powered electrical fence. So it depends on how big your area is, but you can spend, give or take $200 if you go to, you know, um, a farm and fleet or something like that and get all of this equipment for your electric fence. And then you set it up and the deer don't get into the garden. Um, it ultimately depends on how big your garden is, how much, how much it's worth it. And some people don't like it because it's, fencing and you don't want to have fencing around your garden. Um, but it might be worth it if you've got a big enough area and your animals are problematic enough. Yes. Yeah, so if you've got the predator, if you've got those predator smells, you can buy um, coyote essence, um, fox essence, any, any one of those. And that works. Um, same with the fencing, um, cayenne-based, sulfur-based, those stink and people don't like them. Uh, you don't really want to be, yep, you don't necessarily want to be um, outside and potentially smelling that. Um, but it depends on where your garden is. It depends on how much you put out there. Um, it, the sprays you're going to have to reapply, especially after every rain. I've never used um, this stuff, but I'm assuming those pellets, I'm assuming you have to reapply after it rains. 
Sounds good. Yeah, and I've never used this stuff, so I don't I don't know, you know, how well it works, if it's gonna work 80% of the time, 100% of the time. Um, but there, those are just some things that to keep in mind. The predator thing works really well. The issue with the predator thing is that it's gonna be there, and if they figure out that it's the smell of the predator, but, predator, but not the predator itself, um, they're gonna show up anyways. They're, unfortunately, they're not that bright, but somehow they're smart enough to outsmart us. So um, I, don't, I, would think, I would think chives would be the best potential. That being said, I'm thinking about the, the garden that I know that has chives and it's just got chives on one corner. And the chippies, there we go, chives. And um, the chippies don't go where the chives are, but they go everywhere else in the garden. So if you're gonna put it, you're gonna wanna, yeah. Yep. And I mean, yeah, and, and you can really, those grow, I mean, those bush. So you can easily cut a couple of those chives and actually use them in cooking and you're not gonna lose them. And I'm pretty sure they, they regrow year after year. So um, I don't think you have to worry about that. So I'm pretty sure I had dogs who definitely ate our chive plants. They didn't die, but <laughs> they also ate toads. So there were, there were a couple of issues there. Yup, yup. So um, yeah, the only other thing on these, on these management pamphlets, um, these are more general nuisance. They're not n nuisance in your yard. They're not necessarily nuisance um, in your garden. And one of the other options that you always have is um, actually hunting and actually, you know, killing the animals. But you have that problem in Milwaukee where you're not necessarily going to be able to do that um, depending on where you are. So um, that's down there on the bottom. And I think every single one of these mentions basically the same categories, which is fencing feeding, and some kind of repellent, and scare tactics. So um, scare tactics work sometimes, but again, I've seen um, people put predator decoys up, you know, the, the big great horned owls that you put on the corner, and that lasts for about a day and a half until the birds figure out that it's fake. Yep. So that's, that's the kicker. You got to be smarter than the animals. So the decoys will work, um, and even if you don't do predators, you can do... Um, for the turkey, on the turkey management page, it talks about it a little bit. You can use mylar flagging. So it's the reflective double flagging. And you put it just on, you know, a little foot tall post or something like that. And you tie it around. And so it's reflective and it waves in the wind. Um, so it moves and it, it scares the animals away, especially if you put it kind of in different places and you keep moving it. Um, that helps a lot because then, you know, they, they get used to something over here and then you move it over here and then it, it kind of messes with their head a little bit. Mylar flagging, it's, it's reflective flagging if you, if you go online. Um, but yeah, that works, that works relatively well. Um, you do have to move it. And it actually works if anyone has issues with um, coyotes or raccoons. That also works relatively well, um, the mylar flagging, because it's, again, that scare tactic. Um, so same with, with turkey. You can put fences up. Fences, you don't have to worry about so much with turkeys, because like I said, they don't like to fly if they can help it. So if you've got a small enough garden and you fence in your garden so they can't jump over it, yeah, they're probably not gonna go too far unless you've got something really, really tasty in there um, because they're, they're pretty lazy and they're kind of chunky. They're more, they are more seed eaters, but I have eat, seen them eat vegetation. Yeah. Uh, actually, turkeys, depending on whether or not they're messing with your garden, sometimes they're really good because the one thing they do eat is the poults. Um, the, the baby turkeys eat bugs. That's their primary diet source is, is bugs. So plant some poults in your, in your garden, let them have at it. Maybe you'll be able to get rid of some, rid of, some of your bugs. Um, when it comes to turkey, if you have a turkey problem, um, stop feeding your birds. Um, when the food isn't there anymore, they're gonna move on and go somewhere else. I've actually heard of people having issues with aggressive turkeys. Um, I've seen wardens be chased to their trucks by turkeys, which is really funny. Um, but I was in the truck, so I can't necessarily say whether or not I would be able to stand up to it or not. They're kind of big birds, especially in um, springtime, um, early spring. Um, it's just getting into the breeding season, and they get really excited, and they will chase anything that they think is a threat. Um, so, yeah. Or girlfriend. They have to be nice to the girlfriends, though, so that's the difference. Um, but yeah, so um, they can be aggressive, but again, scare tactics. Um, getting big and running at the at the turkey. Um, also, if you know, um, 
the mylar flagging will work pretty well. I've seen the, the decoys work. That's one thing turkeys are not that bright, um, especially if movement, um, they don't have, they've got really keen eyesight. So if something's moving, they get really leery about it for whatever reason. Um, and moving um, the little ducks or something with the wings that go in the wind, that might even work, something like that. Just some kind of movement that it puts them off a little bit. Um, there's a lot of repellents that you can use for turkeys as well. Basically anything that has a bad taste, the fox urine would potentially work for that as well. Um, again, the same discussion that we've had, whether or not you have to reapply it or not is, is the key. So another thing, especially with the smaller animals, um, rabbits, squirrels, even um, coyotes and raccoons to a certain extent, um, modifying their habitat. So rabbits really like um, big clumps of um, woody debris. So after you prune your trees and you throw all the all of the tree branches in a corner of the yard, rabbits love that because they can go and hide under there and the fox can't get them and the coyotes can't get them and they can hang out there and they're perfectly happy and they've got your garden with all their food just not too far away. So if you remove that that habitat for them, um, you can drastically diminish the chance that they're actually gonna, because they're not staying in your yard, they have to go somewhere else to um, to spend the night. And so, you know, there's the potential that they're not gonna be bothering you as much. Um, same with raccoons, um, boarding up, if you get a raccoon or a squirrel in your house, um, boarding up those spots where they can get in or underneath the porch. Um, right now, especially, we've got baby raccoons and baby squirrels all over the place, baby fox and baby coyotes as well for that matter. Um, something that I always tell people is if you have baby animals that are using um, your living area and you don't want them there, especially you know if you've got squirrels and they've got the nest is you know in your attic, where's, where are mom and dad gonna go and get food for those babies? Um, any, as close as possible ultimately. So what you do is you put with an extension cord, some kind of a large spotlight or something like that, and then a radio. Um, not on super loud, but on loud enough that it's gonna be irritating. The reason why they're in your attic is because it's quiet and it's dark, and as soon as you change that and make it loud, mom will probably come and move all of those babies out of there. Um, I've seen it happen with coyotes. You get coyotes underneath your porch, you put that underneath there, and they leave pretty quick. So. Um, mom doesn't like that and it's again kind of that scary tactic mentality so yeah. so yep <laughs> ultimately anytime that you've got if you've got a bird nest showing up that you don't want um, to be there if you know trellises if you're going to be moving stuff the basketball hoop things like that um, you're technically not allowed to to move nests if there's nestlings in them um, there's a migratory bird act of 1973 or something like that that says that you're not allowed to um, harm any migratory birds, which is basically all of the songbirds here. Don't think house sparrows count because house sparrows are invasives. Um, but anything else, swallows, robins, all of those that nest all over the place, doves. Um, but you can remove the nest up, into, up through incubation. So when they're building the nest, when they're laying their eggs, and then when they're incubating, you can actually remove that nest. And if you keep removing that nest, they will eventually go away. You're gonna to have to test who gives out first, but you just have to keep doing it. <laughs> no, you generally don't have to worry about that too much. They just look at you very, very irritated. Yeah. Yeah, and mo that's the other thing too, is if you end up with nestlings, um, most nestlings are only in the nest for two weeks, give or take, two to three weeks. Um, so if you're willing to hold out for two to three weeks, they'll be gone, and then you just get rid of the nest. Um, swallows will re-nest. In Wisconsin, multiple times, robins will re-nest. Um, but you know, it's, this is the same thing as the habitat modification. If you've got any animals that are living in your yard and you don't want them bothering your garden, the best option is to remove their, you know, their living area. So, I really like birds, so <laughs> I'm the wrong person to be talking to birds to be talking about birds. But um, um, one of the ways that you, one of the things you can think about is that a lot of birds, depending on the species, a lot of birds aren't necessarily going to eat seeds. They're actually going to eat insects. Um, so they're going to eat the mosquitoes that are buzzing, buzzing around your house. They're going to eat the, the bugs that are on your plants, things like that. Um, some people that I've heard talk to um, will put native plantings 
in their yard, um, made of trees, native grasses that provides alternate habitat for the birds and then they're less likely to um, come into your garden. I don't buy that because if you've got the habitat and you've got the food, they're gonna go to the food. Um, that being said, it depends on, um, again, what kind of birds you have. So swallows, if you've got swallows um, or robins for that matter, they're going for insects. Um, they're not going for seeds as much. Um, a lot of the warblers, the house sparrows, the sparrows are going for seed. Although the kicker is that I think almost every songbird out there, if they have a nest, they're feeding their nestlings insects because um, the birds, the baby birds have to go grow so quick that they need a really high in protein diet. So they, even if the parents aren't eating seeds, they themselves are, they're feeding insects to the, um, to the babies. So there's still the potential that they're getting rid of insects, even if they are sparrows. So, yeah. Well, actually, it's it's less likely that woodpeckers are killing the tree. It's more likely that the woodpeckers are hammering on the tree because the tree's dying and it's rotten out on the inside, and there's they can hear the tasty grubs running around in the tree. That's normally what happens. Is if you have a woodpecker on your tree, you know that that tree is in the process of dying. That's uh, it depends on the size of the tree, and I think some uh, certain trees are um, less resistant to woodpecker damage. Um, but as a general rule, if you've got a woodpecker on a tree, it's because there's grubs inside the tree. And yeah, and that means they're, it's already having some issues beyond the woodpecker. Yes, they're very pretty. And we've got a lot of them. DNR does not help. Um, we will send you in the direction of um, wildlife control agents. So there's private companies that will remove. I actually talked to a guy who had an aggressive turkey in front of a business um, and it was chasing people. And so I put him in contact with the wildlife control guy and the wildlife control guy went out there and, um, and trapped that turkey. Um, live trapping, if it's on your, if it's on your property, you, if you are the landowner or if you have permission from the landowner, owner, you can live trap pretty much any animal. Reloc relocation is kind of it's kind of a touchy subject. So first of all, I don't I honestly don't suggest um, relocating animals because a lot of the animals that you want to relocate the squirrels, the raccoons, there's a lot of them already. Um, and if you relocate an animal, chances are pretty good that there's another animal who's already living there, and then you're gonna have a fight between two animals, and that you just through that animal you just take you, pick you up, and throw you in Dallas with no food and no friends, and you have to survive there. So it, it's one of those things where it can be kind of difficult for the animal to, to survive. Um, people do it well-meaning because they, they don't want to hurt the animal. They just want to move it. So um, for, for moving, if you do want to relocate animals, um, you cannot move it onto public property um, unless, and you can't move it onto anyone else's property unless you have permission. So you need permission. If you move it to your 40 acres outside of town, or if you move it to the other side of your yard, that's fine. Um, but you, you need permission. And I can tell you right now that the majority of public properties out there will not grant you permission um, to move animals onto their property. So. Yep, um, county parks, state parks, city parks. Um, yeah, you're not allowed to move it onto public property. So, so you've got the wildlife control companies and then you've got um, the other um, organization is USDA Wildlife Services and if you have a problem it's through the Department of Agriculture if you have a problem a nuisance animal um, they will potentially help you remove that nuisance animal so they do that with geese because they're they're uh, um, they're under, covered under the Migratory Bird Act and they will sometimes help with woodpeckers um, but if you contact a wildlife control specialist um, who has a private business, ultimately, he, if whatever you want to happen, if you're willing to pay for it, uh, as a general rule, they will, they will help you to the best of your ability. Um, no, I don't know about them, but if I were one of them, I would not promise any results because it can be difficult and it can be very time consuming, um, but they will try their hardest to, to help you out of your, out of your situation. So generally, um, unless we have an aggressive, um, an aggressive coyote that is actively um, chasing people, um, we, we just say, you know, that's natural. 
a lot of times when, when I get that phone call, I ask someone, because I don't just get it in the county parks, I get it, there's a coyote walking down my neighborhood street. Oh, cool. Ultimately, when I get those phone calls, I ask them, I say, okay, well, is that coyote, um, when you go outside and look at that coyote and that coyote sees you, does it run away? Does it walk closer to you? If you walk towards it, does it run away? Um, if you have a coyote, um, we, have, we have stages. So generally, as soon as a coyote sees you, it's gonna run away. There's a lot more coyotes in Milwaukee than you actually see. Uh, the vast majority of them are gonna run away before you even see them. Um, the ones that are more comfortable, especially in the urban areas, they'll sit still when you come outside and just watch you walk around. But until you actually walk towards them, um, they're generally not gonna do a whole lot to you. Um, and if you walk towards them, a lot of times at that point, they'll, they'll turn around and run away. If you walk up to a coyote and you get you know, within five feet and it's still standing there, or if it starts to growl at you, that's starting to be an aggressive coyote, and then we start, then we have a conversation about possibly removing it. We don't remove it, you call the wildlife control specialist, um, and then you put a trap out um, on your property, or if you have neighbors who are willing to have that trap on their property. Um, ultimately, the issue that I have, or the issue that, that you have with coyotes is that if you want, if you don't want the coyotes in your area, but you don't have an aggressive coyote, you trap a coyote that's not aggressive, there's gonna be another coyote that's just gonna take its place. It's there because there's habitat, it's there because there's food. Um, as soon as you remove one, you're just gonna get more coming in. Um, so if it's, a, if it's aggressive, absolutely, you get rid of it. There are plenty of coyotes in the world. They're beautiful creatures and I love them, but um, I mean, we all have to live together, and if they're going to be aggressive, then then that's just not something we can no, handle. I, yeah. A lot of times, with the the county is pretty hands off um, with their properties. Um, and the other issue that you have to think about too is that um, you call the county and you complain about how much goose poop is out on those fields. Someone else is calling them and telling them how wonderful it is that all those beautiful geese are out there. So they they have a very large amount of public and they all have very different opinions about those animals out there. Um, if there's a big enough problem, you can contact wildlife services. Um, I already said that you can't kill um, migratory birds. Geese, you can get a permit to um, oil or addle their eggs, which basically means that when they lay, um, when they lay their eggs, you go out there and you um, put oil on the eggs so that um, the, the nestlings won't hatch and then the geese keep sitting on the eggs so they don't re-nest. So you don't actually kill the, you don't kill the geese, but you, uh, remove the potential for having further geese, more geese in the area. There are, there are cities that do that, um, especially if they have a really big, um, goose problem and if, um, the majority of the public is, is behind, um, that idea. Um, they will do uh, goose roundups, and I've seen it especially on like private lakes. If you have a lake owners association, they'll do that. Um, they do goose roundups. Um, normally, I think in June is when they normally do that. Um, and then a lot of a lot of those um, geese do go to um, shelters or something to that effect. But again, it it depends on um, where it is and the people that are in the area. I mean, Milwaukee County Parks, you have. How many people in Milwaukee County that all use those parks? And you're going to have a hard time getting everyone to agree on one one solution. And there are there's um there are some of the some of the county parks. I don't know which county park specifically, but I know some of the county parks um, do the the egg oiling that I was mentioning. So they don't remove the geese, but they do remove the the potential for reproduction. Yep, yep. Which you'd be surprised how easy it is to find an egg, a goose nest. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's just, um, there's a lot of different options available and, um, especially on public property, um, you're never going to have anyone that's, everyone that's going to agree with you. And it's, it's a, it's a big burden on everyone. Well, so generally geese generally nest for about a month. So if, if the eggs hatch, it's generally about a month. I have seen, depending on the goose, um, depending on the IQ behind the animal, um, they will sit on the nest for another week or two. Um, yeah, but what happens a lot of times is um, what we see is, especially in Wisconsin um, with birds, they will re-nest if there's enough time. But if it hits um, probably June, um, middle of June, animals aren't, the birds aren't going to re-nest because if, 
you build a nest and you lay your eggs and um, your nestlings hatch, it's going to be well into August, and then a lot of those ant a lot of those birds are going to have to migrate yeah. within a month, and they don't have the resources to so to survive that. <laughs> Something about the aeration. So eggs need. Um, there's yeah, because yeah, because there's actually um, there's minuscule holes, and that's how <laughs> oxygen is rotated into the egg. There's there's a lot of different ways people do it. My best suggestion would be um, a a bullet, um, but a lot of people use a lot of different ways that I don't necessarily approve of, like drowning. Hatchet hatchet would work if you can get the animal to sit still. That would work really well as long as you get one solid solid you hit. Start but <laughs> I did not I did not condone that. Not even close. <laughs> not what I'm here for. So, yeah, there's people. People do thing do certain things that I don't approve of. Um, drowning is not not acceptable. Um, yeah. yeah, if you're gonna, would you like to drown? Yeah, if you're, I know people who who do. Um, I don't know if you ever had chickens, but they wring their neck. Um, but you you can only do that if you really know how to. And I'm not comfortable doing that. So we talked about turkeys. Really quick, um, don't feed turkeys. You can erect fences. You can use scare tactics. Like I said, turkeys, I mean, you guys have seen turkeys. Turkeys are pretty jittery. Um, so the mylar flagging works pretty well for them. Um, mm -hmm. yep, that's another option. If you've got issues with rabbits or small small mammals or something like that, mice, get, yep, get, get the, provide the habitat available if you do like a, um, I know someone who keeps a, um, a post um, outside a, a nice um, post for for watching prey, and the the hawks will sit there. And I have no, yep, have it in their yard yep, because because no. they want to keep keep the rabbits out of their yards. So yeah, the yep, the yep they, I have watched Co I've watched Cooper's hawks scare birds off of the bird feeder and into the window because they know that once they hit the window, they've got they've got free pickings. Um, for squirrels. Um, Repellents or scare tactics can you can use them to keep them out of um, out of your garden. Um, if you want to keep them away from buildings and stuff, um, I get a lot of phone calls about squirrels nesting in attics. So if you just make sure that you you keep those holes closed up, um, try to make sure that no tree branches are leading from the tree to to the building. Um, so that just prevents their you know their path to get into into the building. Um, so that's the best option with squirrels. Uh, like I already mentioned, if you've got squirrels nesting in your house, put the, the radio and the spotlight in that area and mom will generally move those squirrels. So I think right about now, squirrels should be, the babies should be pretty much full grown or they're small, they're smaller than mom and dad, but they're, they're basically just a smaller version of mom and dad. So they should be able to get out of there on their own. So, um, yeah, I mean, you can do some kind of netting or just keep keep those pots high enough up that the that the squirrels can't get to them. Um, the, I think uh, like a cayenne based pepper spray, especially if it's um, if you've got in the pot, if it's flowers or something that you're not going to be eating, I would think that would work pretty well. Although, again, um, application, I don't know how much time it'll take for the, the application. So, um, but yeah, I think repellents would work really well. Yeah, I've heard a lot. A lot of good things about cayenne based sprays but I think this would work too I've actually yeah I know people who you guys know sriracha sauce yeah. I know people who've done sriracha sauce and water and sprayed it on stuff wow. the other thing that I've heard that works for a lot of these regardless of it's in your garden or not um, which is going to take time on your part um, is just some kind of water bottle whenever they show up just spray them like does anyone have a cat where you spray your cat if it's doing something bad basically the same concept or a hose any other questions comments yeah no problem no problem thank you thank you